Greetings, whole people nation. I am Joy Benton, and I have the electrifying announcements to fuel your excitement for the week of April 7th, 2024. Experience the power of convenience by downloading the Fairfield app from the app or Google Play stores. Stay in the loop with our Lighthouse Weekly and other church communications delivered right to your inbox. For a wealth of information, check out our website, app, or social media platforms. Explore easy options to give your tithes and offering in person, electronically, or by mail. Let's shower our April babies with love. Happy birthday to all of our incredible April celebrants from your Fairfield family. May your special day be filled with joy, blessings, and unforgettable moments. And to all the couples marking their anniversary this month, here's to love, laughter, and countless cherished memories. Your Fairfield family celebrates your journey together and wishes you continued happiness. The Fairfield family received thank you cards from Livia Hardin and family acknowledging our acts of kindness during the passing of her sister. Our noonday Bible study will meet in person this Wednesday, April 10th, 12 o'clock p.m. as we continue walking through Revelation. Catch the 12 o'clock p.m. session via streaming at 7 o'clock p.m. Our fitness program, Exercise Your Faith, will convene in the Michael Benson Family Life Center at 1 o'clock p.m. Our first quarter church conference will take place this Wednesday, April 10th, 7 o'clock p.m. in the Sons House. Ministries are asked to present their first quarter reports. Forms can be found on our website. All members are encouraged and welcome to attend our quarterly conference. Join the marriage ministry for an enriching MATE event on April 13th from 10 o'clock a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. in the CL Nall Fellowship Hall. Discover ways to strengthen your relationship, invest in your marriage, and become whole couples, whole relationships, and whole marriages. Don't miss out on the fun and fellowship we enjoyed at our last meeting. Register on the FBC app or website and let's share and learn together. Our Next Gen Youth Experience will take place on Sunday, April 14th, 9.30 a.m. in the Michael Benson Family Life Center for youth potty trained to high school seniors. Parents, please visit our website to register your children for the Next Gen Experience as soon as possible. Pre-registration is required for youth attending the Next Gen service. Please visit the Next Gen page of our website and app for updates on Next Gen service changes. Please join the Season Saints Ministry for a delightful gospel brunch on Sunday, April 14th at the Atlanta City Winery on Ponce. Monica Lisa Stevenson, along with special music guests, will be performing. We will depart from the church promptly after the service. You are also invited to celebrate the anniversary of the Season Saints Ministry with a day filled with food, games, and abundant fun on Saturday, April 20th at 2 o'clock p.m. Volunteers are warmly welcome, and vendor tables are also available for those interested. Secure your tickets for the April 14th event and more information on the April 20th celebration by stopping by the kiosk after service. Get ready for the celebration of Fairfield's 139th church anniversary taking place on Sunday, May 19th. Stay connected for more information. Visit our Yoke Bookstore on Saturdays from 10 o'clock a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and on Sundays before and after service. Discover a treasure trove of fair wear, Bibles, and other enriching Christian resources. Our bookstore is available for you. Join us every Monday at 7 o'clock p.m. for corporate intercessory prayer. Join the prayer call by dialing 540-792-0100. Zero one zero zero and enter access code four three two six six nine pound. Join the Kingdom Men every Thursday at seven o'clock p.m. in the administration building for the gathering, an evening of prayer, Bible study, and fellowship. Fair Care is here to meet your spiritual and physical needs. Fair Care is a one-stop shop for congregational care. If you are in need of assistance, please visit our website and click on Fair Care. Our service and supporting ministries are ready and willing to assist you. Sunday school takes place on Sundays at 8 o'clock a.m. in the Zach Brown Administrative and Educational Center, as well as on Zoom. Please visit the Christian Education page on our website to connect with the online sessions. Don't miss out on any of our upcoming events, vital announcements, and exclusive updates. 
keep those notifications on for the app for the latest happenings at Fairfield. Visit the announcements page on our website for additional announcements. Let's stay united, informed, and empowered as we keep pushing. Have a blessed week. Come on, can you say amen again? How many know that God is? God is our all in all. Amen. We welcome you to this 930 service. We are the deacons of Fairfield Baptist Church, and we're going to come to you with a scripture prayer and a song, but we want y'all to go with us. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Fairfield. We're going to be coming from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and 23rd verse. If you are able and willing, would you please stand to your feet? It says, For I have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it and remember to me. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearer and especially to the doer of his work. Amen. Remember me. this old journey. Thank you, Father, for all my brothers and sisters who have assembled themselves under the sound of my weak voice. Father God, you know their needs better than I can ask. Bless them in a special manner. Bless the sick and the shut in everywhere. Bless the careless and the unconcerned. Bless mankind everywhere. And Father, help us to know that all our help come from you. And Father, we want to say thank you and much obliged. Have mercy on our pastor, Reverend Eric, Eric George Vickers. Have mercy on Pastor Ben. And Father, when we have come to the end of our journey, Father, when we can no longer call upon that holy and righteous name, Father, grant our soul a resting place. Father, we ask it all in our son Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I have to cry sometimes. So much trouble. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night. But that's all. Cross.
Glory to God this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. You know that Jesus will fix it. That's a good thing to know. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, Fairfield. Good morning. Say good morning to your neighbor this morning. Yes, yes, yes. If you are a first time worshiper with us today, wave your hand. And if you're worshiping with us virtually, wave in the chat this morning. We just want to know that you are here with us worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. As you welcome each other, I ask that you stand, take out your mobile devices, and as you stand and take out your mobile devices and welcome our guests today, we want you to take selfies this morning. And as you take the selfies, we want you to stand and we want you to take those selfies and we want you to upload them so that everyone may see as we welcome each and every one of you this morning in the Lord's house where the presence of the Lord is there is liberty so let us stand as we do our welcome song and as we welcome one another Oh, people. your attention to the screens, please. saluting and congratulating our baptismal candidates today. Amen. We thank and praise God for each of you, for the public profession that you have made. And we want you to know again that this is a signal day in your lives where we commemorate that you are now walking in the newness of life. And so we are excited to present your baptism certificates to you. And so when I call your name, I will invite you to come forward and receive your certificate. 
Certificate of baptism. This certifies that Avon Welch was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on the 7th day of April, 2024, Fairfield Baptist Church, Eric George Vickers, pastor. Come on, Evan. Brenton Wells. Come on. <laughs> Certificate of baptism. This certifies that Brenton Welch was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on the 7th day of April, 2024, Fairfield Baptist Church, Eric George Vickers, Sr. Pastor. Congratulations, man. <laughs> Certificate of Baptism. This certifies that Jody Horsley Jr. was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on the 7th day of April, 2024, Fairfield Baptist Church, Eric George Vickers Sr. Pastor, congratulations, my brother. God bless you. Certificate of Baptism. This certifies that Delon Kuntz was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. On the 7th day of April, 2024, Fairfield Baptist Church, Eric George Vicker Sr. Pastor, congratulations, my brother. Fairfield, again, would you help me praise God for our candidates? Amen. In the name of the Lord be praised for God's goodness, God's mercy, and God's grace shown toward us. This is the day that the Lord has made, we've come to rejoice and be glad in it. What a joy and what a privilege it is to be in the presence of God. I don't know if you are aware of this or not, but there is an alternative. That while you and I are alive and the blood is running warm in our vein, we could have been, should have been, would have been. There is an alternative. And yet the Lord has allowed us another chance and another opportunity to be in his presence. And lest we forget, four years ago, uh, we were not gathered like this. We were at home watching our devices. Very few of us were in this place, and yet the Lord has allowed us to gather in his presence where there is fullness of joy. Somebody ought to be glad about it, that we are alive and well. And not because of any goodness of our own, but because God has been good to us. Amen. Uh, just a few observations at this time. Please, brothers and sisters, mark your calendars for April 10th, 2024. April 10th, 2024 at 7 p.m. for our first quarter church conference. We will come together in this space and share all that God has allowed us to do thus far. And we can also look forward in anticipation to all that lies before us. And so we invite you to come out and be a part of that sharing together on April 10th, April 10th, April 10th. Today is April 7th, April 10th at 7 p.m. If you come at 8 o'clock, you will miss us. And so we invite you to come on out uh, at 7 p.m. as we give God thanks and praise for all that God has allowed us to do. Also, we invite you to join our marriage ministry mate on Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. in the C.L. Nall Chapel Fellowship Hall. Breakfast will be served, and we are asking that you will register online so that we can make proper accommodations for your presence. All married couples, engaged couples, serious couples, we're asking that you come on out uh, and be part of mate. Amen. And then today, we know we have some very special guests, all of our first-time worshipers. We greet you with Jesus' joy. But I also want to acknowledge in a very special way the Lithonia High School class of 1997. Are you here? Can you make some noise? Can you just stand up? Amen. Wave at us. Amen. God bless you. They are guests of Brother Johannes Benton. Uh, and we thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, and Sister April Leprez, a member of this class, is the author of Biblical Black Love, an adult coloring book. Amen. Thank you. Hold on one second. Biblical Black Love. Is this right? Amen. 
And so we are asking uh, that you would stop by the kiosk after worship to support Sister April. And uh, let me see here. Let's see if I can still color inside the lines. And so we are asking that you support uh, Sister April. She's in worship today. And I just think as a whole, as, as a people, uh, that we should do a better job of supporting one another. And so we have an opportunity to do so today. And Sister April, we're going to support you. And we thank God for your presence today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Amen. For all other announcements, brothers and sisters, we invite you to consult our website, fairfieldbc.org, and to kick the tires on our social media sites so that you may stay apprised of all of the happenings here at Fairfield Baptist Church. Amen. Well, it is offering time in the house of God, and we are excited to participate in what God is doing in the earth. What a joy and what a privilege it is to be counted uh, upon by God to be his hands and feet in the world to execute his will, his plan, and his purpose for the whole of creation. We know that when we give during this time of stewardship that we are not giving to the church, nor are we giving to the pastor. That's too low of an aim. If you give to the church, the church will let you down. If you give to the pastor, the pastor will disappoint you. I, I would not give to the church if I were you. I would not give to the pastor if I were you. I would entrust my resources to the God who has given me everything. That, that's what we're doing now. We are giving back to God out of faithfulness, out of obedience, because of his love and his expectation of us. What does the Bible say? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat, provision in my house. Prove me, test me, try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, that I will not do what? Open up the windows of heaven. Pour you out blessings. And you won't even have room enough to receive it. And God says if you put your arms out, you won't be able to hold it. If you open up your coat, you won't be able to keep it. That's the kind of God we serve. God blesses us so abundantly that we are saturated. We are covered. We are overwhelmed with his goodness. Have you ever tried to take inventory of all that God has done for you? Has anybody ever been able to keep an accurate account of all that God has done for you? Do me a favor right now as you're preparing to give. I know you're writing your check. I know you're, you're checking your account. Uh, but just, just take a moment and think about all that God has done for you since you have opened your eyes today. Go ahead. Take 10 seconds. And I guarantee you while you're thinking, you're missing something. While you're praising you're forgetting about something. In fact, even as you're clapping, even as you're thinking, God is yet blessing. God is yet pouring out his goodness over your life and over your family, over your house, over your business, over your job, over your neighborhood, over your job. God is blessing you even right now. And so it is a joy. It is a joy to give back to God. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. With whatsoever measure you give, that measure will be measured back unto you. To all of our first-time worshipers here at Fairfield, this is the only offering we receive. If you care to give, we invite you to stand with us and partner with us through the ministry of giving. And know that when you give to God through the ministry of Fairfield Baptist Church, you're not giving to the church, you're not giving to the pastor, but you are giving back to God, believing by faith that God is going to take these resources, stretch them into sufficiency for the relief of the poor, for the spread of the gospel, and so that God's name will be magnified in the earth. And so as we rise, as we are able in mind and in body, we recite our stewardship confession. It tells us what we give, why we give, and the blessings tied to our giving. Are we ready? Let's do it. I am a cheerful giver and a bountiful sower. I am committed to giving my time, talent, and tithe. 
I believe that God is the source behind every resource. I believe that God will supply all of my needs and make all grace abound toward me. Father, we thank you and we praise you. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we know that all good things come from above. We thank you, Lord, because we realize that it is in you that we live and move and have our being. Now, Lord, as we endeavor to be found faithful and obedient to your word, we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased with our giving. We pray now, God, for all of those who will give. We pray for those who have of no material substance but have a desire to give. We pray now, God, that you would bless them so that they are able to participate next time. Now, Lord, we take no credit for ourselves because all of the glory belongs to you. We pray that these resources will be used to bless your kingdom. We pray, God, that you would give us generous hearts that we would pour out because we have so freely received. Now, Lord, we pray that you would bless us in our giving as you sustain us in our living. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now give according to how the Lord has prospered us.
justify he has done great things. He has done great things. When I look back over my life, he has done great things. The Lord has done great things. Whereof we are glad. The name of the Lord be praised. There was something tied to that. The choir said, he has done great things, so I will bless the Lord. If you know that God has done great things, there'll be some cause and effect. When you know that God has done great things, Marvelous deeds, wondrous works, miraculous action. It ought to make you clap your hands. It ought to make you, it ought to make you open your mouth. It ought to make tears fall. It ought to make you indicate that there's movement in your body with the waving of hands. There ought to be some sign that God has done great things in your life. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need the choir to remind us of what God has done. When you woke up this morning, you ought to have the goodness of God on your mind. When you go into the kitchen and open the pantry, you ought to have the goodness of God on your mind. When you open your closet, you ought to shout great things. <laughs> when you turn your car over and see that the, the tank has gas in it, you ought to shout great things. When you go into your app and you see in your account there's money there, you ought to shout great things. And if you walked into the house of the Lord under your own power or you wheeled in here with your own strength, you ought to be shouting great things. Every time I talk, I see great things, great, great things. Hallelujah. He has done great things. Fist bump somebody and tell them he's done great things. Look at somebody else and tell them, I don't know what he's done for you, but he's done great things for me. Opened doors that I couldn't see. Made ways that I could not orchestrate. He's done great things. Excuse me if I make a little noise here. In fact, you might need to give me a little room. Because when I couldn't see my way, he made a way. He's done great things, great things, great things, great things, great things. Grab your Bibles. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we serve a God who does all things well. John chapter 20, I just want two, two verses. All week long, I've been ruminating on resurrection reflections. John chapter 20. I want to grab your attention with verse number 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written 
so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk about the gospel according to you. The gospel according to you. You ought not need any help knowing that God has done great things for you. It's a personal thing. Now, I, I'm serious. I, I really mean this. That when you think about God's goodness in your life, you don't need to come to church to be reminded of that. You don't need Sunday school and Bible study to know that God has been good to you. When you drive on 75, 85, or 20, or 285, and you pass an accident that your car was not involved in. You are aware of God's goodness to you. When you are reminded of the doctor visits that you had. And previously the doctor said we see something on your scan. But when you return for a visit they can't find it. You know about God's goodness to you. If you have ever had a problem that you could not solve, a situation that you could not fix, a solution that you could not engineer, you are readily reminded of God's goodness to you, that God has done great things for you in your life. You don't need to come to church to be reminded. You know that. You, you, you know that. And I believe that's why John's gospel is so important for the believer. John's gospel, the, the fourth witness, the fourth evangelist, primarily comes as encouragement to believers to be reminded that Jesus is who he said he is and that he came to do what he said he would do and that if we hold on despite what we face we will live to see the truth of Christ's divinity not just in the end of time but in our everyday lives presently. John's account of the gospel comes to remind us that God has done great things. And if we believe that he has done great things, we ought to live our lives in such a way that it points to the reality of who Jesus is and in so doing, it persuades others to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Allow me to say it this way, that if we believe that Christ is who he said he is, based upon our own life's witness and testimony, our lives ought to be a walking, living, declaring Bible. Your life, my life, ought to be legible to an illiterate world. These verses lift in a climactic fashion the entire purpose of John's gospel. Here's what John says in a nutshell. This book does not contain every single thing that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. 
It, it, it doesn't include every miracle. In fact, John's account of the gospel only includes seven. There are only seven miracles in the entire gospel according to John. And John's gospel is different from the synoptic gospels. John's gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic gospels, meaning that they, they look through the same eye or the same lens. They differ from John. John's gospel beginning in the second century CE was known to be the more theological gospel. That instead of John using Jesus as parables, John quotes Jesus as telling these long narrative stories that often follow each of these miracles to communicate a point about Jesus, which is this. He is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And that you should have enough evidence based upon what is presented to believe that he is the Messiah. I mean, think about your own life. It might seem that John places us at a disadvantage, but the reality is John's gospel is just like you and me. I mean, really think about it. If you were to sit down, I'm about to help myself. If you were to sit down and write the most important experiences that you have had with Jesus Christ, how many things would you include? I mean, this is for you. This is personal. If you had to write your own life story, for whatever reason, there might be. Who would be there between each line of pain and glory? If, if you had to write your experience with Jesus Christ, what would you include? Can I press it even further? If you had to write your own story about your walk with Jesus Christ, what would be left out? Can I help you help me help us? Time does not permit us to write everything that the Lord has done for us. Our memories are not even long enough to remember all of the things that the Lord has done for us. But there comes a point well, after you and I have taken inventory of all of the things that the Lord has done for us, there comes a point where we say, you know what? I've got enough evidence already to testify that God has all power, that he's a miracle worker, that he's a promise keeper, that he's a way out of no way that he's a light in darkness, that he's a bridge over troubled water. I don't have enough time to tell you all that the Lord has done for you, but just let me list some of the things. And after I tell you some of the things, it will be the proof. It will leave no doubt that he is who he said he is. The time of our text, Jesus has already been raised from the dead. John doesn't even bother to talk about the ascension of Jesus because according to the way that John writes, it is already implied that when God raised Jesus from the dead, that was the proof that you needed to show that Jesus was the Son of God. But then John takes it a step further. Even though John does not detail Jesus' ascension some 40 days later, he does include some things that happen after Jesus has been raised to authenticate that Jesus did not cheat death, but rather he defeated it. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. 
Jesus appears to his disciples. And when Jesus appears to his disciples, here's, here's the problem. Only 10 of them are present. Judas has already committed suicide. And the Bible does not tell us where. It only tells us that Thomas, called twin Didymus, was absent. Jesus showed up and Thomas was absent. If I had like two more football minutes, I would talk about the danger of being absent when Jesus is present. Jesus shows up where the disciples are gathered and he shows the evidence that he is stronger than what happened to him. He He shows the proof of his nail-riddled wrists and the spike marks through his ankles. And and he shows the evidence that a spear had been thrust in his side. And ten disciples saw it, but Thomas missed it. And when Thomas returns after Jesus leaves, he hears the testimony, he hears the report But Thomas does not believe. Thomas doubts. Now, I think it is important for us to humanize Thomas for a moment because truly what the disciples have said really is unbelievable. Think about it for a minute. We are not too far removed from Good Friday. We know the brutality that Jesus endured being whipped within an inch of his life. A Roman tree pressed upon his shoulders to carry up the winding Via Dolorosa. We're not too far removed from Good Friday. We remember the sound of spit being launched and landing upon his body. We're not too far removed from Good Friday. We we remember watching the blood stream down his face as the crown of thorns was affixed upon his head. We remember it. We remember watching him being lifted on that tree, suspended like a billboard above the highway. As he tried lifting himself, struggling to breathe as he was dying from asphyxiation. We're not that far removed from Good Friday. And we heard what he said. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And after he said this, he gave up the ghost, he died. We know he died. Didn't he die? Surely he He died. They watched him die. Joseph, Joseph had permission to retrieve his body and laid him in a borrowed tomb. They were there for the funeral. I want to humanize Thomas for a moment because throughout time we have villainized Thomas for his disbelief. But the truth is, Thomas makes a whole lot of sense. And the truth is, there's a whole lot of Thomas in all of us. I, I, I can understand where Thomas is. Maybe, maybe Thomas doubted because he had empathy for the disciples. Perhaps he said they are so grief stricken and they miss him so much that they just, they want to see him. Maybe they saw his doppelganger. Maybe they saw, you know, everybody got a twin somewhere. Maybe, maybe they thought they saw Jesus. Maybe they saw his half-brother James. Maybe James stopped by along with his sisters. Thomas doubts. And although Thomas had been part of the crew when the widow of Nain's son was raised, this was too hard to believe. Thomas Thomas was there when Jairus' daughter was lifted back to life with a word from the man. Thomas was there. 
Thomas was even outside of the cemetery when Jesus stood from a distance and called forth for Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave, still bound in his grave clothes. Thomas was there, but there was something about the trauma of watching Jesus be crucified that would not allow Thomas to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And then one week later, one week after the resurrection, they are all gathered. Jesus was not physically, physically present when Thomas uttered these words, but here's what Thomas said after hearing his brother. He said, I will not believe until I touch his hands. I will not believe until I take my hand and put it in his side. And one week later, Jesus shows up. I've learned in my life, be very careful. What you allow your mouth to open and say, especially to God. One week later, Jesus shows up in the room. Thomas was absent the week prior, but he's here now. And, and, and Jesus shows up in the room and he walks directly to Thomas almost to say I heard what you said <laughs> here you go Thomas do what you need to do that's not good enough for you he, here you go here you go Thomas Take as long as you need. Examine for yourself. Touch me so that you know that I'm, I'm real. And then Jesus says these words. He says, you now believe because you have seen. You, you believe because you have touched. But blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. I do not believe it was an accident, brothers and sisters, that John places verses 30 and 31 after Thomas's encounter with Jesus. Can I suggest to you this morning that, that doubt is not the opposite of faith? The truth is, all of us, no matter how saved and Bible-believing you might be, all of us live with some semblance of doubt. In fact, I want to free about 15 of us. I'll make 16. When I suggest that doubt is a little healthy for your walk with God. Doubt still leaves room for the possibility for God to blow your mind with the unimaginable. <laughs> doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is the process by which we continue to work out our faith. A little bit of doubt is necessary for your journey because doubt reminds you and me of our own finitude. You know what doubt does? Doubt says to us, I can't do that. Doubt says to us, I've never seen that done before. The problem is when we allow our doubt to grow larger than our ability to trust in the power of God. It's not that Thomas doubted. It's the fact that Thomas's doubt was a little larger than his ability to trust in what Jesus said about himself. So John comes. And after Thomas moves from doubt 
to full belief. Here's what John says. This ain't the only thing that Jesus has done. In fact, Jesus has done much more than what I've told you. But these are written that you might believe. And don't you know, brothers and sisters, that that is what all of this is about? All of this is about your ability to believe. Pastor, I don't understand why God has allowed me to go through some of the things that I've gone through. It is so that you can believe. Pastor, I don't know why my family, I don't know why my job, I don't know why all of these things have happened. to It is so that you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he's the anointed one, so that you can believe that there's nobody like him. And here's the thing, if you believe it, You can now be a witness in the world of his power and his might. Can I say it this way? You can't convince somebody of that which you do not believe yourself. I I was having a conversation just the other day with a very dear and trusted friend of mine who said, you know what? I, I, I am amazed by con artists. I'm amazed by con artists. Con artists are so proficient at their lies that they believe it themselves. And because they are so convincing to themselves, it is easy to persuade others because they are believable. They believe it themselves. A con artist wouldn't be a good con artist if they didn't believe the lie that they were telling. And we are not con artists. We are Christians. And what we believe is not a lie, it's the truth. And yet, would you believe that even though we are truth bearers, there are many of us who do not live as if we believe what we know and profess. Pastor, I don't know why. I don't know why my ministry isn't growing. I don't know why my small group isn't growing. I don't know why nobody wants to come to my church. It's because you don't live like you believe what you say you believe. That's why the New Testament writer says we are living epistles. Your life might be the only Bible that somebody reads. And if we were to open the book of your story, if we were to read your witness, of Jesus Christ, what would your story read? What would be the opening lines in the gospel according to you? How would your life bear witness to the saving power of God through Jesus Christ? These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And, and I, love, I love this rhetorical device that John uses. It's, a, it's called a colophon. Some believe that, that John 20 is the final chapter in the original gospel according to John, and there are others that contend that John 21 is, is, is not a later edition, but it is part of the original manuscript. But there we find at the end of chapter 21 that there is a verse that is similar to that which we read today. It ends in a similar fashion. Here's how the end of chapter 21 ends. Jesus did many other things that are not written in this book. And I would believe if all of the things that Jesus ever did were ever written down, that the world would not be able to contain the books that are written about him. I'm done with my post-resurrection sermon today. But I've just come to suggest to you that if God has been good to you, If God has really done great things in your life, then you ought not be ashamed to let folks read the gospel according to you. There ought to be so much evidence of God's wonder-working power in your own life 
that you don't have time to tell it all, that, that, that you don't have opportunity to remember and recount all of the things that God has done for you. In fact, you ought to be able to look back over your life and say, you know what? I could spend the rest of my life talking about Jesus. I could spend the rest of my life writing about Jesus, but I've got so much evidence. In fact, when you look at me, you are looking at the evidence that Jesus is the Savior of the world. When you look at my life, you are looking at the proof of what nails in a hand can do and what a spare in the side can do. When you look at me, you are looking at evidence that God is not done writing good news. Is there anybody here who can lift up holy hands and thank God that your life is a testament that God is not done writing good stories? John says that Jesus has done way more than I could ever write down. He's done more than I've ever expected, more than I can ever recount. And that ought to be somebody's testimony today. I can't tell it all. It would take two lifetimes to talk about all of the great things that God has done for me. That's where John is with it. And here's essentially what John does. John takes the pen out of his hand and puts it in our hand. Here's summarily what John says. John says, I have now given you enough evidence that you ought to be able to believe for yourself. I have given you enough evidence that you ought to be able to look at your own life and see how he makes ways and how he opens doors and how he still gives newness of life. Somebody ought to be here today testifying, glad within your soul, glad that you are a witness that when you read your own story, you can testify. I don't need any help. I don't need the choir to sing my song. I don't need the preacher to preach from my favorite scripture. I've got the gospel according to me. And when I reread my own story, when I think about what God has brought me from, when I think about what God has kept me from, I don't even always need to crack my Bible. I can just press rewind in my mind and think about his goodness over my experience. I can just thank God when I look back and remember how God has sustained me and covered me. And I got to agree with James Cleveland. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. You may not be able to quote Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but you ought to be courageous enough to quote the gospel according to you. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior. The doors of the church are open. You may be here today. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I want to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But I don't feel like I fit in yet because I don't know enough scripture. I mean, I know Psalm 23 and I know John 3.16. Come on, God bless you. But I, I don't know if I'm quite ready to make that, that step. Maybe you didn't know this, but studies even suggest that for folks who are outside of faith, they are not interested in how much scripture we can quote. They assume that we know scripture. Folks want to know from our lives, does Jesus Christ make a difference in one's life? 
I've shared it with us before, but it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, I would have been a Christian had it not been for the Christian. That when I look at the lives of so-called Christians, I don't see a difference between the way they live and what they say. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of a community that bears out the evidence that Christ is alive and well and that his power is at work in my life. I want to know that the miracles that Jesus worked in Scripture are still possible today. That's what John says. John shows us that the miracle working power of Jesus Christ is still alive today. That's what the gospel according to you ought to say. I'm the evidence that Christ is alive and well. If you're here today, you want Christ. Maybe you're here and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and, and you want a church home. No better day than today. No better church than Fairfield Baptist Church. We would love to be your family. I would love to be your pastor. If you're here today, why don't you come? Don't delay. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Harden not your heart. That ever happened. Anybody believe that that ever happened to you? Come on, God bless you. God bless you. Are you here? Is this your day? That ever happened? The church say amen. amen. 
Would you join me in celebrating God for those who have responded to the call today? We have one that has come by way of baptism. Amen. Ten years old. And she says, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and I want to live for him. And I said, that's good enough for me. And then we have one who has come by way of recommendation to unite with Fairfield Baptist Church, and we simply say, welcome home. And to both of you, for the decision that you have made today, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one, and we've got two, and we don't believe in letting heaven party by themselves. And so come on, Fairfield, let's celebrate and thank God for the two who have made a decision today. Come on, we can do better than that. The name of the Lord be praised. We are so excited to welcome you to Fairfield. Uh, out on the other side of celebrating Holy Communion, we're going to get some information from you in addition to sharing some information with you about what your decision means. And so we invite you to just sit tight for a moment as we share in Lord's Supper together. And on the other side of that, we'll escort you to our prayer room and speak with you further about what your decision means. Is that all right? God bless you. And welcome to Fairfield Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. He would not come down from the cross to save himself. He decided to die just to save me. Something comes over me when I think about that fact. And he could have exercised his sovereignty. But instead of allowing the cup to pass from him, he decided to drink from the bitter cup and went to Calvary with you and me on his mind. That's enough to shout about all by itself. We thank God for the supreme sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we prepare our hearts and minds to gather around this table for the fourth time this year, let us now bow as we ask God to forgive us for our sin. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this sacred opportunity to come around your table. We realize, Lord, that we are unworthy to occupy this space. But by your grace, you have made room for us. We pray now, Lord, that you would forgive us for all of our sin, individually and collectively for all of the ways that we have disgraced your cross and your cause. We pray that you would cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Throw it into the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. And Lord, as we have asked for your forgiveness, we pray that you would allow us to forgive one another so that we come not to this table in condemnation. Help us to forgive as we are forgiven to love as we have been loved. May we be ever grateful for what you did for us on that old rugged cross over 2,000 years ago. We love you, we thank you, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come on, let's raise that up. He would not come down. From the cross. Come on, every heart. Just to save himself. He decided to die. Bless your name. Come on, one more time. Can we make one big choir for all of the grateful folk? He would not come down. The night in which Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let us eat and be thankful. In like manner, he took also the cup saying, this is the New Testament of my blood, which has been shed for the remission of sin. And I will not drink it again with you until I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. Let us drink and be thankful. The Bible says that after they communed together, they went out into the Mount of Olives singing a hymn. He decided to die just to save us. Anybody grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus? Anybody grateful that he died with you and me on his mind? Anybody grateful that death could not hold him and the grave could not keep him? Anybody have a gospel according to you that you can tell the world? He decided. Bless your name. As we prepare our minds and hearts, just before we leave today, please don't forget to stop by the kiosk and support Sister April. To all of our first time worshipers, we thank God for your presence today. I pray that the peace of God would surround you wherever you go this week. And if you are connected to a church home, please give your regards to your church and your pastor on our behalf. Again, we are so grateful to God, to those who have responded to the invitation today. We invite you at this time to follow our First Impressions ministry as we share some information with you. Would you join me in celebrating this music ministry, thanking God for them today, for the way that they've blessed us, these deep to led us in devotion, blessed us in such a phenomenal way. Thank you to our media team, security, First Impressions, Amen. Thank God for you, our deaconesses, our mothers. We praise God for you, all of these ushers, everybody who's somebody, which is everybody. We thank God for you. We honor our pastor emeritus and our first lady emeritus for their presence today as well, along with their family. I hope and I pray that all of you have a safe week, that you wear your sunglasses tomorrow. Do not look directly into the eclipse. Amen. Your job will not give you disability if you do that. Amen. As always, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. As we rest upon our feet, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, blessing. Praise him. Here below. Praise.
praise him above. Ye heavenly hosts. And Holy Ghost. And God said unto Moses, tell Aaron and his priestly sons that when they bless the people of God to give them this blessing, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the Lord God Almighty bless you in your downsetting and your uprising as you come and as you go in the city and in the field, in your joy and in your sorrow, in your labor and in your leisure. Be blessed, my brother. Be blessed, my sister. Until we meet at the feet of Jesus where there's neither sunrise nor sunset. To him be glory in the church now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. And there's nothing they can do about it. God bless you. Have a great week.